I have with me in studio uh, Mufti Sayyid Harun Al Azri. Mufti Sahib, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran. Uh, fun. Mufti Sahib, last week we started our series and uh, one that is quite important, I would say, and we unpacked the different um, tariqas or rather Sufi tariqas which leads uh, to one road and that ultimately leads to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and sallam. ultimately to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And with that, we also unpacked and cleared some uh, misconceptions and misunderstandings pertaining to uh, tasawwuf or, or Sufism as well. And uh, this evening uh, we're going to do... Uh, more or less the same thing as well. However, this evening we are channeling our 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 topic pertaining to one specific awliya. As we have spoken about the tariqas deriving from various awliyas. Right. So, uh, in also in, in in the time of commemoration of of the urs of. Um, Ala Hazrat, inshallah. Uh, so we will be discussing the life and the teachings of Ala Hazrat and, and who uh, Imam Ahmad Raida is actually. And with all of those things, we'll also be discussing some of the, the misunderstandings or misconceptions when it comes to some of his teachings uh, or some of his followers as well, inshallah. Okay. So um, I, 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 we, we did a, a nice Q&A last week, which, which we will continue suit with this week as well. And then next week being the final, I know we will be having... Um, Hafid Fuzel Sufi in studio with us, inshallah. So oh. perhaps uh, in the remainder, we can, if if time does allow, we can just give an introduction briefly on, on who the guest we can expect uh, next week is, inshallah. But nonetheless, just to uh, continue with the, the topic of discussion for this evening, um, during this time of, of the year, uh, globally, we, we hear the, the terminology of, of Urus or, or Haul or whatever it is we want to call it. But uh, for this uh, this specific awliya is Allah Hazrat Imam Ahmad Rida. So tell us, what firstly uh, the term urs or, or hawl is? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidi wa habibi ya Rasulallah. When we talk about uh, urs and hawl and wali, so remember wali is a singular word and then awliya is the plural. So that is the first thing. So you mentioned we're speaking of a certain wali today, Imam Ahmad Raza Khan. So we'll talk about his urs. Now what mean urs? Urs is a death anniversary. When someone passes away, the date of death. And another word they use is hawl, meaning that a year has passed over. And in Cape Town, what we call it when we have a khatam when someone passes away? Uh, yar, uh, a yar katal, uh, yes, something. Yes. Meaning one year you'll have a khatam for the person when they pass away. Or we'll use these terminologies only, wisal, where they connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Based on the hadith that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, uh, al to jusr that uh, death is like a, a, a bridge. And the pious people used to say, a bridge from the lover to the beloved. So you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you cross over. So it's leaving this uh, transition from the dunya to the akhirah. So urus is, linguistically, it means the night of uh, marriage. So it's a night of marriage, which is called the urs, a marriage, a union. So here it's showing that the uh, Beloved, the person who loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when I love someone, so Allah loved them, they loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a lot of love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is where they're leaving this trials of this dunya, all these problems of the dunya, just to go into the realm of the akhirah. You know, so that's why they gave it the name Ors. I hope that makes sense. Allah knows best. Inshallah. So speaking of, of uh, the, the, this understanding and, and explanation, are there perhaps any proofs uh, when it comes to Quran and Sunnah as well? Okay. So when we look at the uh, idea of uh, urs, what do you do at uh, urs? You must always look at the essence of something. What actually takes place at a certain event? Leave what is the name. What really takes place at that event is important. You know? And when we look... It is Isali Thawab. Urs means Isali Thawab. Sending Thawab to the person who passed away. Sending Thawab to the person who passed away. Now is there proof for it in the Quran and Sunnah? Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Hashar, Surah 59 verse 10, that those people who will come after, they will say, Yaquluna, Rabbana gfir lana, Oh Allah forgive us. Wali ikhwani na ladina sabaku na bil iman. And those people who passed away before us with iman, so Allah said we're going to say this. Allah said we're going to make dua for them. And we're going to ask Allah to forgive them, right? So now we know that it is allowed to make dua of maghfirah for those people who passed away before us. So in the urs gathering, what we do? This is what we do. Then when we look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullu ma'rufin sadaqah. Every good deed is a sadaqah. So reading Quran, is it a good deed or a bad deed? 
a good deed. Good deed. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Kulu ma'aruf in sadaqah, every good deed is a sadaqah. And the Prophet guaranteed us that sadaqah reaches the mayyit. Because one sahabi came and said, Ya Rasulullah, if I give sadaqah, charity, on behalf of my parents, will it reach them? He said, yes, it will reach. So sadaqah reaches. And every good deed is a sadaqah. Reading Quran is a good deed. So we'll read Quran. Then we will recite praises of the Prophet ﷺ, teaching people about who is Rasulullah wasallam. That's a good deed. Talking to people and telling them that, listen, this is how you must live your life. Now at the Uras, we'll talk of the Wali. The Wali got close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He made the dhikr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wrote these books. And in his books, these are his teachings to get you close to Allah and his Rasul. So yes, it is allowed. And there's a lot of thawab. Let me tell you one beautiful incident. On the Ra'as, on the hole, on the Urs of the martyrs of Uhud, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in hadith is in Bukhari, he goes to the graves of the martyrs of Uhud. And at the grave, he calls them and he tells them he wants a mimbar. So they put a mimbar. A mimbar you don't get just at the grave, do you? No. You don't get it on Mount Uhud. So from Medina, they had to go with a special intention that they are going there. And then the Prophet gave them a lecture. So the Sahaba in a gathering, and the Prophet is giving them a, a lecture. What we do in ours? Gather people and give them a lecture. So Rasulullah is giving this lecture. On what occasion? On the occasion of the Ra'as, of the whole of the martyrs of Uhud. And then he, is, he makes a dua for them. And then he talks to his companions. And the companions, they have tears in their eyes. And they say that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi when he gave us this talk, like he was leaving us. He was bidding farewell to the living and to those who passed away here. And the Prophet is standing there and he said some miraculous things. He said that Allah gave me the keys of the heavens and the earth. And where I'm standing from now on this member, I can see my fountain of Kothar in paradise. And then the Prophet says something beautiful at the graves. He says, I don't fear for you shirk after me. I don't fear for you shirk after me. But I fear that you will compete in the dunya. So my point from this hadith is not even about competing in the dunya, all of that. My point is that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi spoke to the Sahaba. He had a gathering. He spoke to them. And he was speaking about the Ahlul Bayt and he said uh, of uh, Sayyidina Hamza and all of that. And those who passed away. And he spoke about that he fears for them. He doesn't fear for them shirk, but he fears for them the dunya. So meaning that that's what we have. That's what we call ors. That's what we call ors. Allah knows best. So uh, we were speaking uh, this evening on, on the personality of Allah Hazrat. Um, who exactly was Allah Hazrat? Allah Hazrat, he was a, a genius. Let's say that. He was a genius. He was a polymath. A person who knew multiple disciplines of education. He knew the different sciences, all the sciences of Sharia. And he was such a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant alim. His research is immaculate, unmatched. Any dalil he gave, he gave Quran and Sunnah. He never gave any Mickey Mouse dalil. No. Quran and Sunnah. Yeah, this is what the Quran says. This is what the Hadith says. This is how Rasulullah said. This is what the great Imam said. And he followed Imam Abu Hanifa in a very strong way. So he says about himself. No one can give a better introduction than you give of yourself. Because you know yourself. So he says that he is Muhammadi, follower of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's a Sunni. He follows Sunni version of Islam. In Aqeedah, Ash'ari Maturidi. Then he says he's Hanafi. Right? He's a Hanafi according to Fiqh. So Aqeedah, he's a Sunni. According to Fiqh, he says he's a Hanafi. And then according to Tasawuf, he says he's a Qadri. So he says he's a Muhammadi. And then he explained to you what Muhammadi means. It divides in Iman, Islam, Ihsan, what we spoke about last week. So he says he's Muhammadi, he follows Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But in which way? He is following the Sunni way, he's following the Hanafi way in Fiqh, and he's following the Qadri way in Tariqah. And then he says he holds firm onto the Ahlul Bayt of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He holds on to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He holds on to the Ahlul Bayt of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He holds on Hazrat Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. He holds on Khwaja Mu'inuddin Chishti. And he says, he don't say Khwaja Mu'inuddin, but he says Hazrat Ghosi Azam. He holds firm. And then he says his name. Abdu. He is the servant. Abdul Mustafa. The servant of Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ahmad Rida Khan. So he was a great genius, a great scholar, a great wali, a great saint of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Subhanallah, he is the mujaddid. If you want to say in one word, he was the mujaddid, the reviver of the 21st century. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, every hundred years I will say, uh, the Prophet says, every hundred years I will send someone to revive the deen, to renew the deen, to revive when it is dying off, I will send someone. And the mujaddid 
of our century is Imam Ahmad Rida. Subhanallah. So, um, Mufti said, one of the, the, the misconceptions that we find uh, in today's day and age is, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, Allah Azrat and, and uh, his teachings, perhaps, uh, there, there's a misconception or a misunderstanding when it comes to group du'as and, and gatherings, uh, whether it is allowed or not allowed. Uh, what is the, the stance on this matter? So, when we talk about uh, group gatherings, right, we said last week first, you see, the, the issue comes in when people never study. So if you don't study something, then you have a problem. If you never study how the Sharia makes rulings, how you do things, there'll be a hundred things you would do. You won't say, no, it's against the Sharia, right? But if you do something on this side, then you say, no, 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 because it has, it, it uh, sounds Islamic or seems Islamic, so now khalas, this is bid'ah and it's haram. Let me give you an example. If I ask you, brother... Was he, uh, bro, uh, bro, uh, brother Kamruddin, if I tell you, listen, my dear Abdul Salam, that um, if you give, you tell you you're going to come with four friends, you're going to meet on Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m. and you're going to give out 50 heaters. Will you say that you're doing bid'ah or anything? Or it won't cross your mind? <laughs> it won't cross your mind? Absolutely. Although you specify the time, you gathered four people and you gave a specific number of heaters. But if I say, let's gather on a Thursday night after Salatul Maghrib and we recite 50 times La ilaha illallah. No, that's a bid'ah. No one done it. Remember, there's two types of ibadah. Ibadah which has a fixed framework, like you have to make three Maghrib and two Fajr. Like that, it's fixed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's other things which are just normal actions. But if you make it with the intention for the pleasure of Allah, you will be rewarded as ibadah. So like the Prophet said, Wafalul khair. Or the Quran says, Wafalul khair la'allakum tuflihun. Do good that you may be successful. The Prophet said, help the poor. How are you going to help the poor? He never tells you specifically how to help them. Now imagine if you're helping the poor person by giving them heaters. Did you fulfill the command of the Prophet? Yes or no? No one can say nobody wasn't heaters in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I think we have a very big misunderstanding first of how things work. If there is evidence, so here it must be based on the fixed framework and on this side it mustn't go against the Quran and the Sunnah. It mustn't go against the Quran and the Hadith in any way. So giving heaters, does it go against the Quran and Hadith? No. So likewise, when we're talking of gatherings, right? we can find in the Sunnah of the Prophet there were gatherings. Take example the Sahaba. They sat in a gathering. Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Abu Sayyid al-Khudri radiallahu anhu. He says, we were sitting in the gathering. And when the Prophet came and he asked, what are you all sitting here for? They say, we are thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us with you. Huh? We are thanking Allah for blessing us with Islam and blessing us with you. Man Allah bika with you, ya Rasulullah. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, is that the only reason you are sitting here? They say, yes. This is the only reason, Ya Rasulullah. There's no other reason that we are sitting here. So the Prophet said, I'm not asking you all because I doubt you. I'm saying because Jibreel came to me. And he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking amongst the malaika very proudly about this gathering that you all are having here. Gathering is there. So gathering is not something wrong. People make, no, no, you can't gather. The Prophet never prohibit us from gathering. So see, for example, if I'm gathering for a braai at home, or maybe eat day, Eid day, we say we're having Eid lunch at home. Did the Prophet say you must gather for Eid lunch? He never gathered. But you got all the family and you feel you're doing a good deed. Because that's that type of ibadah what doesn't go against the Quran and Sunnah. It's good things. You're feeding the people, the Prophet. So it falls under the general framework of the Sharia. There's no issue with that. But you can't come say, no, no, but Mufti, you can't invite your family home because the Prophet never said you must invite family home on the day of Eid. Meaning you don't understand the deen. You don't understand the deen. But now if... We call the people for Eid day. And while we're all sitting there, when we're talking all nonsense, no one has a problem. But now what if we say, okay, right, let's read salawat upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or let's pick up the Quran and we all recite Quran. No, 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 this gathering is bid'ah now. You understand? So it's a faulty way of thinking. It doesn't mean because two things look the same or it, uh, apparently it looks like this, then it is wrong. No, we have to understand that these things, if it has Dalil, if it has evidence in the Quran and in the Sunnah of its permissibility, and there's nothing in the Quran and Sunnah prohibiting it, then it's allowed. Allah knows best. 
Inshallah. So now there are some that, that claims that um, Allah has, read, uh, has, has given uh, some some kufr fatwas on on big scholars and so on. Um, how do we how do we clarify this? See these scholars till today. Whether you find the scholars of Saudi, you find the scholars of Egypt, you find the scholars of South Africa. Certain scholars will work with a certain framework, and based on that framework, they're going to say, okay, this person is a kafir or is not a kafir. So, say for example, if I'm following a certain framework, which is the Ashari Maturidi, the Ahl Sunnah framework, and it says that you cannot attribute physical body parts to Allah. So now you open a Qidat Tahawiyah, they say anyone who says Allah has body parts, that person is kafir. You open Sharhul Aqaid and Nasafi, and you will see that, okay, that no, this is uh, Imam Tiftazani explains anyone who says that Allah has body parts, example, is kafir. Then you open another fiqh book. They say anyone who says Allah has physical body parts is a kafir. Now if someone insists to you, no, Allah has a hand like my hand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sits like how I sit. Now he's giving body parts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So according to those scholars, will they be regarded as kafir or not? Yes. So it's not that Imam Ahmad Ghadaw was calling people kafir just for fun. That if they never meet the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, if they went against the ijma, like at once, he said, that he believes that the Shias are kafir, those who say that Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar are in Jahannam. They are kafir. So he says that there is ijma of the ummah, that these were the sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We can't let you get away by you saying that they in Jahannam. So basically, according to us, you are kafir. We can't consider you as a believer. Right? Or like in our time, everyone believes. Qadianis, those who believe that there is a Prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All our aqidah says that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is khatam al nabiyyin Muhammad is the seal of prophethood. Now imagine if someone is saying, no, 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 Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after him there is Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, he is the final prophet. What are you going to say? According to your belief system, does he meet the requirement? No. He will be called a kafir. Because we learned in all the books of aqidah that if someone claims prophethood and nubuwa after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a kafir because the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, la nabi abadi, there is no nabi after me. Right? So I think it's just a misconception. The imam done his research and based on the aqidah of Ahl sunnah if he gave a ruling, he gave the ruling. Allah knows best. So there's also uh, amongst um, his followers and students, uh, there are groups that, that, that creates a lot of... Uh, division and, and fitna I believe um, and, and normally when we learn about the awliya globally we learn that they are, are pious people they are friends of Allah they, they only you know devote the entire being uh, to the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so uh, how, how is it such that um, you know certain followers can do things like this um, is this uh, part or not part of Allah's teachings an easy way to answer that is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a perfect human and Islam is the perfect religion. But Islam is not what the Muslims do. You get good Muslims and you get bad Muslims. Right? So you can get the Muslim, he's busy drinking and committing zina and stealing and doing all the wrong. Do you blame Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for that? No. So yes, you get the followers who must represent the teachings of Imam Ahmad Rida. And they will go around and calling people kafir and making fitna and saying Allah has said this is haram and this is like this and this is like this. But they're not representing the Imam. Like how so many Muslims don't represent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, there's this one video where this man, he's standing with two women who are practically naked. And when they ask him, who's your role model? He say, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Does that give a right image? That does not give a right image. <coughs> but he said it. So like that, many of people claim that they are followers of Imam Ahmad Rida, but they don't live up by his teachings. Allah knows best. Okay, so... Um, there are also some misconceptions in, in you know, sometimes where we learn that greeting everybody is, is, a, is a noble act. And whether you are Muslim or non-Muslim, are there any limitations in, in his teachings when it comes to, to uh, greeting Muslims or non-Muslims? See, when you have to remember, when someone gives fatwa, it is subjective to the place and the time. So, say Imam Ahmad Ghuda in his time, according to his circumstances, what were happening, the British were taking... Uh, Muslim children away and the way they were bribing them and pulling them say like now in Medina you get people they, they, they say go to Medina University what are they doing there so me I don't follow the Wahhabi way 
And I believe that uh, there's certain irreconcilable differences. So if they believe Allah has body parts and that, and I don't believe that, I feel that would be kufr according to me. But now if they're getting our youth, they say, go, we're giving you scholarships. Giving you scholarship, giving you money, paying for your flights, paying for everything. You're going to go there, we pay you to study. Who don't want to study? Subhanallah, and in Medina tul Munawwara, so you're going to go. So now certain scholars will say it's not allowed to go. And other scholars will say, no, it's allowed. It's just going to learn everything. So however, people have different views. That's life. Now coming here to see in his situation, he said that they mustn't learn English. Learning English is haram. Now why did he come up with that? It doesn't mean you can't write his books in English. He said learning English is haram because at that time they, were, they had the missionaries who were taking the people away because they're the ones from British who could teach the people English. So people were going to those schools and becoming non-Muslim basically. They were rejecting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they were learning other ideologies away from Islam. So did he have to say that it is haram to go and learn English or not? Circumstantially, yes. Right? In the prophetic time, when those Jews broke the treaty with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the Prophet said, don't greet them. Don't greet them. So according to the circumstances. But it doesn't mean it's a universal rule. We can greet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, لَا يَنْهَاكُمُ اللَّهُ عَنِ الَّذِينَ لَمْ يُقَاتِلُكُمْ فِي الدِّينَ Allah does not say, Allah don't prohibit you from those people that you must be good to them and be just to them, those who never fight you against your deen. So if they are not combating your deen, they're not throwing you out of your house, they're not doing bad to you, why must you be bad? Huh? If your neighbor is a non-Muslim and he's like, you know, good morning, how are you? You're like, good morning, how are you? You're okay. You see him, you'll be happy with him, you'll be good. Because Islam taught you to be good. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa when he used to do his qurbani, he used to say to Aisha radiallahu anha, start off with our Jewish neighbor. Start off with our Jewish neighbor. He lived with them in Medina tul Munawwara as citizens. No one can be more pious than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So when people are saying, no, don't associate with this one, don't be with this one, don't be with that one. That's not the teachings of Imam Ahmad Rida, <coughs> nor is it the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if the Imam said, don't do, uh, meet with this person, don't do that, read his context, read why he said, and what was his reasoning. Allah knows best. Gee, now, uh, for, for those who know uh, the personality of, of Allah Hazrat and, uh, you know, uh, some of his teachings and so on would would know there's a term that, that we, we, we call some of the, the followers perhaps, and uh, which, which is Barilvi. Which is uh, which is also Sufi or so on. Does uh, Mufti Sab um, maybe conform to to to, to this type of way? <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So when we talk about uh, Barelvi, it's from Bareli Sharif, the city. So like Imam Bukhari was from where? From Bukhara. So he was called Bukhari, right? Someone is from Medina, they call Madani. Someone is from Makkah, they call Makki. So we get the point. So if you're from a certain place, then you get a certain title of your place. You know, you're from Cape Town, you call Kapi, <laughs> right? So you have it based on the place. Later on, it evolved into an ideology as well, right? One of the teachings and explanations of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Like how you would have Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki in Fiqh, all four different schools, but following which school in reality? Following the Quran and Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It doesn't mean because you are Hanafi, you're not following Quran and Sunnah now. No. So likewise, Bareli was a place and it was a place of education. And what education they, 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 they educated there? They educated, as he said, the Hanafi education, the Qadri education, they, and the Sunni education. So it was called Bareli. So it's a place of where you learn. Like how you have the academic center in Dioband. So they are called Diobandis. And these people were called Barelvis. And later on it became known as a theological ideas and clashes, what they had and all of that. So yes, if someone asks that you know, you're a Barelvi, yes, I'm a Barelvi from a point of view that we sought education from this type of school and understanding. Right? But I'm also an Azhari because I sought education from Al-Azhar Sharif. And I'm also a Dusuqi because I sought education from Sheikh Mukhtar Al-Dusuqi. Right? And I'm a Radawi because I sought education from Jamia Radwiya. And I'm a Ziyai through Ziauddin Madani. <laughs> so the different schools of thought where you're taking knowledge and all is knowledge of what? Allah Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Allah knows best. So, um, wow, wow. When, when, uh, when one reads Quran normally, um, we would sit at home or in a car or wherever we want to read Quran as well. But when it comes to some of the, the, the students uh, of, of Allah Hazrat, um, 
they, they, they sometimes are found sitting around food, for example, and re- reciting Quran. Um, what exactly uh, does this signify? Uh, signify? You know, today I went for um, a nice uh, sitting of hadith. And while they had the hadith, they were moving, they had um, Loban, what we call Loban. I'm not sure what they call it here in Cape Town, right? But it's the incense, the smell. Like Bukhur. Right, Bukhur. So as they moving with it, as they passed the Alim, now the Alim wants the Bukhur, you know? And you saw like some of the muftis and sheikhs on, on TikTok and that, they will put the Bukhur under their clothes, right? So every old sheikh wants the good smell. So what they do is they walking past, the sheikh do like this. No, no, sheikh, they walk past, he do like this. The other the sheikh walk past, they do like this. Now people think, hey, what's this new ritual they're doing? But it got nothing to do with the ritual. It's just something like, you know, you want the fragrance on you. It's almost like passing atar around, right? But the way it looks, it looks like a ritual. Now someone might misunderstand and think it's a ritual of that. So here you are reading, but your food is here, right? After you read, what you're going to do, you're going to eat. I went for a khatam once. While I was reading Quran, they brought pizzas. When I saw the pizza, I closed the Quran, I put it there. Because I never want to distract myself from Quran. Opened the pizza and I ate it. I was hungry. And everyone looked at me. Because they thought that, you know, only after you read, you can eat. But like, the food is hot there. Subhanallah. Let us have a bite. Have a bite and then carry on reading Quran. There. The Prophet ﷺ said, if food is there, and it's the time of salah, first eat, then perform salah. <coughs> so your mind is not thinking of the food. Now coming to the idea of why do they read on the food or buy the food or whatever the case may be. Like when the Prophet Wasallam told Sayyidina Sa'ad to dig a well for his mother. After he dug the well because that's the best charity the Prophet said. He dug a well and what the Prophet said? Hadihi li ummi Sa'ad. This is for the mother of Sa'ad. Meaning that the thawab is for the mother of Sa'ad. What is the type of food? Right? Meaning food and water goes together. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks uh, of it uh, with uh, Dawood alayhi salam. But it's a technical discussion. But the point is, here the Prophet said this is for the mother of Sa'ad. So now when they have a food here, they say, okay, this is for my mother, my deceased mother who passed away. We're going to eat this, everything. And the Prophet said the best sadaqah is it'amu ta'am to feed food. So um, uh, which is the best action in the sight of Allah? The Prophet said it'amu ta'am. So they got the food here because they want to give out the food when they finish. It's not you reading it because of the food. You're already just preparing. You understand? So if you're preparing, you're having a thicker, and now you have the chocolates there. It's not because you're reading on the chocolates. The chocolates are there, but to give out in the name of your mother. So when the children eat those chocolates or the uh, public have that, they get happy. they like, subhanallah, and they make dua for your mother. It's all about dua. It's all about dua. Allah knows best. Uh, we're running short of time. Um, I'm hoping that we can uh, cover everything that we've uh, that we've uh, expected to. But nonetheless, just a, a quick uh, question before I move on to the to the uh, uh, remainder. We we often listen to to Kawali myself as well, and even on the show we we often would play uh, perhaps a track of Kawali or so. Uh, when it comes to the teachings of Allah, is it, um, what is the stance on on Kawali? Is it permissible or not permissible? So it's a fiqh matter, and fiqh matter you'll always get difference of opinion. So as I said, if a certain scholar looks at the Quran, looks at the Hadith, he comes to his evidence, he says something is haram. That's based on his opinion. And another scholar will come to their opinion. Like as we said, Imam Shafi, rahimahullah, he'll say this is allowed. And according to Imam Abu Hanifa, it will be haram. And vice versa. And it will all have the ramifications of it. So if Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he believes that uh, to touch your wife before going to make salah does not break your wudu. You can go and make salah as a Hanafi without your wudu being broken. But the Shafi will believe that that is totally breaking the wudu. And on another matter, on a Hanafi, if blood comes out, if you get cut and blood comes out, your wudu is broken. But according to the Shafi, it can flow and it won't break your wudu. Right? So however you see it. Now imagine, one is saying you got wudu for salah and the other one say you don't have wudu for salah. Right? They looked at it different. So when we are normal people and we don't know, Allah said, first, Alu ahla dhikri in kuntum la ta'alamun. Ask those who know if you don't know. And you know, sometimes we make mistakes, like me, myself. The other day I made a mistake. Mm, I, I used the ayah of the Quran, but I used the, the, the translation of it from my head. So I said, وَمَا يُغْنِيَ الظَّنْ عَنِ الْحَقِّ شَيْئًا But the verse is, إِي يُغْنِيَ الظَّنْ In and ma means the same thing. Uh, so the point of the verse is, إِي يُغْنِيَ الظَّنْ مِنَ الْحَقِّ شَيْئًا That assumptions hold no weight in front of the truth. So when people have only assumptions, it holds no weight in front of the truth. Even for myself that goes. That day that was an assumption. It had no weight in front of the real verse of Al-Quran. Likewise, there will be scholars 
they will uh, normal people have assumptions no this is right not right ask the scholars first of all the dhikr in kuntum la ta'lamun ask them if you don't know and if they tell you it's halal then you act upon it they tell you it's haram you act upon it you know they will be responsible in the sight of allah allah knows best okay so uh, i'm just just in conclusion um we we spoken about various things that we, we regarding misconceptions and so on so for those who perhaps don't know much about uh, ala hazrat and his life what are some of the lessons we can learn from as ala hazrat's life okay i think if you say number one, imam ahmad <coughs> rida was the great lover imam ishqur muhabbat lover of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he defended this love of mustafa sallallahu alaihi wasallam as they say dalad di qalb mein azmat hai mustafa he put that love and that honor and the veneration for rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in our heart based on the verse li tu'minu billahi wa rasulihi that you believe in allah and you believe in the rasul wa tu'azziruhu wa tuwaqqiruhu wa tusabbihuhu bukratan wa asila that you venerate the prophet you respect the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you defend rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam morning and evening That is Imam Ahmad Rida. Number one important lesson. That is to sort out your iman. Number two, education, study. Imam Ahmad Rida. He never just speak from his whims and fancies. He had the facts. He looked at the Quran. He looked at the Sunnah. He looked what the Imma said. He looked what the Uliya Allahu Salihin said, and then he made a decision on that. So education is very important, right? And then Imam Ahmad Rida had husnul dhan. He never just go around calling people kafir and just because you associated with this he even sat and he met with scholars from the other schools of thought to why to educate them he met with other schools of thought to say that listen this is my view this is why we look at it like that then they will say they look at it like that he say but this is our dalil this is your dalil engagement so if you go and meet with a salafi or wahhabi or with a shia or with anybody it is just to explain to them your part and tell them these are our points these are your points Huh? Same with non-Muslims. How do you give da'wah if you don't engage with people and don't meet with people? It doesn't mean because you just go and call everybody kafir and everybody is going to Jahannam and then you think that is da'wah. No, man. Our Muslims are gone mad. On one side, we we get happy. No, we must invite people to Islam and promise them Jannah. And on the other side, we are saying everybody is kafir. So if you're Muslim, you become kafir. And you're not Muslim, you must become Muslim. I mean, this is madness. Allahu a'lam. Thank you so much for 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 sharing your your thoughts with us and your time as well.